everybody. Uh, yesterday was a heck of a day uh, here in Hartford and uh, down in Washington, D.C. Uh, we may want to talk about that, but I really like to focus on our, our COVID uh, update first because there's a lot going on there as well. And I'm joined, of course, by uh, Paul and Josh and uh, Deirdre Gifford and Reg Eady, as you know, are chair people of our um, vaccine advisory group, which is coming up with an allocation as we prioritize who gets vaccinated. So we'll be able to talk about that with a little more uh, detail in just a minute. Um, the daily summary since yesterday, a couple of things of interest. Um, we now passed over 200,000 COVID tests. Um, 52,000 uh, tests yesterday. We're doing a lot of testing, uh, probably uh, as much or more than just about anybody. Allows us to test, allows us to detect early, allows us to track and trace, allows us to keep our positivity rate a little bit lower, 6.3% uh, yesterday. Um, uh, most of our neighboring states are a little over 7%, so we're, we're stable in that front. Um, Hospitalizations down 52, that's a, a good number. As you know, that's a key metric as we figure out, um, make sure we have capacity to take care of you if you get sick. Um, Deirdre tells me that about 78% of our beds in the hospitals are, are occupied, so that's, um, that's good um, capacity. Less than that um, in the 60s in the ICUs, so we do have capacity there. You know, tragically, our fatalities, um, are still high, 57. Um, the COVID cases, one thing interesting of those 3,300 cases, two of them, uh, you maybe know, are diagnosed as that very highly infectious British strain. Uh, there are a variety of different um, strains of the virus out there. And uh, that's obviously uh, true of most of our states in the region, and we were not surprised. Uh, these are folks um, related to travel, just as a heads up, uh, coming into the state from elsewhere and, um, and younger, 15 to 25, Deirdre told me. Again, worth remembering, um, nobody's out of the woods uh, when it comes to this. Uh, you know, Britain, um, Deirdre has estimated that the vast majority of the infections there now are related to the highly infectious strain. And if you're infected here in Connecticut, um, good chance you're part of that highly infectious strain. What does that mean to us? Um, it just means be even more careful. What it means is if um, you're standing uh, six feet away from somebody for less than 15 minutes and you're not wearing your mask, the chance of you getting infected if somebody nearby is infected has just gone up. So it, it means to be even more cautious. Uh, the good news is when it comes to the vaccinations and ways we can prevent it, the mask is just as, uh, just as protective and the vaccine is just as uh, helpful. So that's good news. The vaccine update. Um, now over 100,000 doses have been administered. Um, about uh, 1,800 have had their second dose administered. We're making progress there. We're still doing... Um, a lot of vaccinations per capita <clears throat> compared to our peers. Uh, number six in the country. Um, most of those other states, as Josh has pointed out before, are states with very low population. A little more complicated vaccinating in a uh, highly dense um, state like Connecticut. And we're doing pretty well on that front. Uh, by tomorrow, all of our nursing home residents will have access to have their first vaccine done. The vast majority of the residents will have taken their vaccine. And that's a really good sign. But amongst the healthcare nurses and the um, nursing home staff, a lower percentage. Max? Seen <coughs> for a lot of reasons, but my two main reasons is I saw a lot of my patient died, a lot. And the second reason is I have a granddaughter, she's just nine. Two years ago, she was diagnosed with um, type one diabetes and she's home with me. So I have to protect them, protect my resident. That's our number one reason. So 
I really, really like people to step up, my co-workers, my union members, and take the vaccine. We were all hoping to get a vaccine. Now it's here, and we don't want to take it. So I wish every one of us could just take it. I have watched firsthand. Hey, that was uh, put together by uh, 1199 who represent all the nurses. I really appreciate what they did there. Reg, you've been there at the hospital on the front lines. Tell us your experience. Yeah, so first of all, let me say thank you to you, Mr. Governor, as well as to Mrs. Redwood, the healthcare worker who participated in, in the video, and of course the SEIU 1199 for putting the video together. You know, hesitancy is real. It's real throughout the entire state of Connecticut, but we see it especially in communities of color. Uh, and so to, to, to put forth a healthcare worker who had the courage to move forward and do the right thing in getting vaccinated, not only to protect herself, but to protect her granddaughter, as, as well as to protect the, the, the citizens that she cares for, is the right thing to do. So hats off to you uh, and to the union and to Mrs. Redwood for understanding the importance of bringing this forward from a hesitancy, hesitancy perspective. Yes, and CVS and Walgreens will be going back to the nursing homes and the hospitals or, um, to make sure that people have that chance to get vaccinated. CT.gov COVID vaccine for your update. We'll be hearing from Reg in just a minute um, as a follow-up. This is interesting, the vaccine program balance. You've probably seen sort of the two extremes out there which impact how people are getting uh, vaccinated and how quickly they're getting vaccinated or how slowly they're getting vaccinated. You know, one side of the spectrum um, are those states that are really micromanaging um, how, what populations get vaccinated. Um, nurses in direct contact in the emergency room get priority over um, staff or those that are cleaning in that same hospital room. That type of specificity is uh, really slowing down implementation of the vaccines in some states. So you can see in our uh, chart there at the bottom, it says, trust in the healthcare professionals. Give them the discretion to get the vaccines out on a timely basis as best you can. The flip side of the coin, not on the micromanagement side, is what um, we've described as the Wild West. Those are the states that say, hey, everybody 65 and over, let it rip. You can uh, sign up on the um, uh, a site that was really created for uh, rock and roll concerts and Broadway plays tack here for uh, vaccinations and there you've seen those long snaking lines of frustrated people who um, aren't able to get the vaccine or it runs out before the time is done um, we're not going to let that happen uh, with reg and with deirdre we tried to provide clear guidance which we're going to get into a minute on who's eligible for the vaccines when we're going to be laying out for you uh, on Monday the reservation platform so that those um, next groups know where they can make an appointment to get their vaccine on a timely basis. As we described before, um, inventory management to make darn sure that there are no vaccines on that shelf at the end of the day or the end of the week, that we get them to where people can get vaccinated on a timely basis. That's why Connecticut t continues to try and take the lead in getting as many of our people, our most vulnerable people, vaccinated as quickly as possible. Uh, the vaccine um, advisory group, you know, thought long and hard about our prioritization. You know about 1A. Those are the healthcare uh, folks in the nursing homes and the hospitals. Uh, uh, and now more broadly, our 1B group, what are we trying to do? A, no surprise, minimize severe illness and death. Look at those most vulnerable populations. That not only doing everything we can to keep you safe and without complications, but to continue to keep access in our hospitals. To protect our frontline workers, they don't have a choice. They can't uh, telecommute. They can't go virtual. Every day they're frontline uh, dealing uh, with us. And we'll describe those folks and why it's so important they be um, vaccinated, protects uh, you and protects them. And finally, ensure equity and access for all of our disproportionately impacted populations. Those folks who live perhaps in the most um, uh, busiest, most congested neighborhoods and multi-generational housing, uh, black and brown, those that are most at risk to suffer complications, most at risk to get infected, most at risk to infect not just their family, but their broader community. 
those were our priorities as we looked at um, the vaccinations as we roll out to the 1B group. Um, here's the 1B chart. Um, our CDC, it really follows uh, the CDC recommendations, broadly speaking. Uh, they had the immunization um, you know, practice group and they helped lay out the priorities, which I just described to you. Um, broadly, 1B includes those 75 and older for reasons you can understand, most likely at risk. That includes those essential workers I described to you before, why they're um, close to the front of the line there and those residents of congregate settings. I bet there'll be some discussion there because of the nature of a, a super spreader event happening at one of those congregate settings. So prioritizing keeping the people there safe as well as their communities safe. Finally is next steps. Over the next two, three weeks maybe, we're gonna get all the 1A people with their first vaccinations, provided you step up. You've heard some hesitancy amongst the nurses. And um, we're gonna have a timeline for you next week for the 1B group that uh, we just described to you broadly. And next week, we will start notifying you. And we'll show you the platform. We reach out to you so you can sign up and make an appointment, probably starting with that group 75 and over, not in that um, you know, nursing home, for example. And uh, those, re those registrations will be coming along uh, pretty soon so we can do this on a quick and orderly basis. I'd just like to um, ask both um, Deirdre and Reg to just take a couple minutes apiece, tell us about the work on the advisory board, the work on the allocation committee, and how you came up with some of these priorities. Deirdre? Thank you, Governor, and um, uh, it's a, I'd like to start by thanking the, uh, Dr. Edie and the members of the allocation, advisor, the allocation subcommittee of your vaccine advisory group. They have been working really hard on this very difficult task of advising you as to how the vaccine prioritization should roll out. So uh, thanks to them for their, their commitment uh, of time. As you just described, Governor, the allocation subcommittee did confirm that they uh, recommend to you to go ahead with the ACIP recommendations for 1B. That is the frontline essential workers and the individual 75 and older. They also uh, added a recommendation to you, as you mentioned, around the congregate settings. The reason for that is because that fits with the priorities that you described individuals living in congregate settings and those who are the staffs in those congregate settings are at higher risk for infection, either from being brought in to, uh, from the community or because of the nature of the, the setting itself. As you mentioned, the spread can be very rapid and very serious in those settings. So the uh, allocation group wanted to be sure that they were included. In addition to that, um, the committee is continuing to consider, and we'll be presenting you with some additional recommendations next week, continuing to consider how to address this issue of equity and disproportionately affected populations. Um, they, uh, uh, at your direction, have made sure that that's a priority in their considerations and are looking at um, a potential addition or two to the recommendation for Group 1B that would address issues of equity. They've also um, uh, been recommending to the Department of Public Health and will continue to work with them even after their allocation uh, recommendations are made, that they keep an eye on the implementation of the vaccine strategy itself. So not only the prioritization, but as we roll out vaccine clinics, as we put things online, um, the, the committee has um, recommended to us that we are sure that language is not a barrier to getting a, a vaccination appointment, that lack of access to sophisticated technology is not a barrier to getting a vaccine appointment. All of the things that have historically uh, prevented people from having easy access to care, they wanna make sure that uh, we and our partners are addressing those and making it easy as possible for individuals who've been disproportionately impacted from COVID to get a vaccine. So um, I, I wanna just say to the public that we know and acknowledge how anxious many of you are to know where you fit in the allocation. And um, uh, we ask for just a couple of, of uh, days and weeks more 
of patients as we continue to build out our process for getting appointments, for notifying you of uh, when it will be your turn to get in line, how to get an appointment, where you can go, what websites to visit, what phone numbers to call, all of those things uh, we're working on very hard right now in public health with our vaccination partners, our local health departments, our health centers, and um, more information is to come in, in the, uh, the days and weeks ahead. Reggie? Yeah, I guess the only thing I'll add to that, and thank you very much, is I, I join you in commending the two allocation subcommittee co-chairs, and they also ask that we thank the advocates out in Connecticut. So organizations that advocate for and represent mental, physical, emotional challenges, et cetera, have been contacting the allocation committee, uh, making sure that their voice is heard. And they've asked that I say to all of you, thank you very much for the work that you're doing uh, from an advocacy perspective, uh, and let, to let you know, uh, and I'll just underscore their, their emotions around that, that that they are going to consider everything that you're saying and will make sure that your voice is heard in the decisions that are made moving forward. Hey, thanks, Reg. Thanks, Deirdre. And um, don't forget Josh and Paul are here. Max? Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Yes, Governor, uh, the prioritization chart that you just showed moments ago, is that the complete list right now, or can we still expand that to other groups? Oh, I think, uh, I don't want to, why don't Reg, you and Deirdre maybe want to take that. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Deirdre. So that's a, um, uh, the list that the governor showed of the frontline essential workers is um, the list that the CDC provided of the um, types of workers that fall into that category. So um, as we roll out phase 1B, we'll be providing um, more information on our website, working with employers and other stakeholders to make sure everybody knows whether they fit into the 1B or the 1C category. Um, we've been getting lots of questions and we realize it's important that we are available to answer those questions and, and uh, make the, the uh, access as easy as possible. In addition to that, the allocation subcommittee, as I mentioned, is um, contemplating some uh, potentially uh, adding some additional groups that may um, address issues of equity, and um, we're anticipating those recommendations at the beginning of next week. Got it. So we are going to be working off of that chart, at least for right now. Um, and when we look at these groups, do we know how many people combined do you think are going to be included in this initial chart? Deirdre told me it's about 800,000. Okay, 800,000. Um, the next question that I have, uh, you know, when it comes to the UK strain here, in, it's in Connecticut right now. Are these cases going to be monitored any differently, maybe put into a different category? Deirdre, do you know that? Yes, um, we will not be able to do genomic sequencing on every single case in Connecticut. Right now, we're, um, we, we're just doing the sequencing in partnership with Yale School of Public Health and Jackson Labs. We're just doing the sequencing on a sample to understand how, uh, first of all, whether the variant was here or not. Now we know that it is. And we'll continue to do this um, sampling to see how frequently we find it. But, um, you know, we, we had 3,000, uh, over 3,000 cases that we reported today, for example. We won't be doing genomic sequencing on every single case. So as the governor mentioned, if you are diagnosed with COVID in Connecticut, you should assume that there's a good possibility that you have this variant. What that just means is take your isolation and quarantine recommendations very seriously. Um, uh, stay uh, isolated and quarantined for the recommended period of time. And for all the rest of us, it means double down on the mask and the physical distancing and the ventilation, et cetera. Channel 3, NBC, Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Matt Austin with NBC, Connecticut. I had a couple of COVID questions, but before that, I just had to get your reaction to some of the events in D.C. Right now, some top Democratic leaders are calling for the removal of President Trump. What are your thoughts right now? <clears throat> well, yesterday was, um, it was tragic. Um, I was shocked. I was appalled. Uh, that it could happen in our capital. 
and that these were images being seen around the world. I've uh, had an opportunity to work a little bit around the world, and um, you know, people really look up to the United States of America and, and, and what we represent. And you know, when you hear Reagan talk about shining city on a hill or Lincoln, you know, last best hope on earth, maybe we take these things a little bit for granted, but um, there are a lot of people around the world that wish us ill, but there's a va lot more that uh, really hope for the best. And uh, you talk to folks, young kids, and they say, I want to go to the United States of America. And so to have those pictures transmitted around the world uh, was heartbreaking because um, I think we're sort of breaking faith with people a little bit. Um, but they got it solved. They got it under control. They, um, they cast their votes. We know who the next president of the United States is. Um, and those are my uh, hard-fought feelings. So it sounds like at this point you're not calling for the removal of the president and simply waiting for the transition to happen? Oh, I see. Um, I think that's right. I mean, 13 days. Uh, look, you got the 25th Amendment. If you think something dangerous could be happening, I, I'd like to think that uh, people will step up and not let that happen. That's not, I don't think, I don't see that happening. And uh, I really want this Congress to be focused on uh, getting our country uh, healed and better, both from a COVID point of view and just bring our country together. Are you aware here in Connecticut of any safety concerns with state facilities? Has security been heightened there? And is it something that you're considering? Um, not so much. I mean, we, we had some demonstrations here yesterday, as I'm sure you're aware. And, um, and I, I think our, um, the Capitol Police and the state police handled that very well, municipal police. And um, I, think, I think we'll be in good shape. Thanks. And just switching gears a little bit to over to COVID, now that we're two weeks past Christmas, a week past New Year's, do you think we've avoided a surge from those holidays? I think it's probably a little early to um, say that, but it is, what, almost two weeks since Christmas, and um, our numbers are still relatively stable. Deirdre says ticking up a little bit. Uh, I see more severe tick-ups in other parts of the country, but... Um, there's, I seem to say every week, the next couple of weeks will really be important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. News 8. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, there is a report, Governor, that shows that the, there's such a low percentage of high school athletes uh, who have been infected as a direct result of school sports. Just your reaction to that and what that could mean um, as far as the CIAC moving forward now? I think um, it's a very low percentage of people related to activities on the playing field, basketball, hockey, whatever that might be. Probably some more infections related to in and around. We can mitigate that if we're very cautious going forward. And um, Deirdre's meeting with CIAC, I think it's as early as tomorrow. And start focusing on um, the January 19th date, which is a date we gave at least to start being able to, uh, you know, practice and condition and uh, make some decisions soon thereafter. I, I've heard from uh, several rink owners, and I know this has gone kind of back and forth and you've um, reacted to their letter, but they're adamant about, um, I guess, there's only one other state from what I was told other than Connecticut that's not allowing at least practice and partial teams on a 200 foot by 80 uh, piece of ice. Um, they insist how, how they're, they would be doing it with kids showing up just 10 minutes before practice or game already dressed, no locker rooms. All they do is put on their skates and, and they're out there. Um, is there, uh, is there anything that they can tell you at this point, or if they revisit with you, that might make that the ultimate decision change? Well, the ultimate decision is, uh, what, 12 days away is the 19th. I think that was the date we all agreed to going back a couple of months ago. I think it's been pretty successful. We are more likely to have our schools open safely than uh, most other states. We have a relatively lower infection rate. Believe me, I'm not saying because of hockey games. I'm saying that's why we continue to err on the side of caution. And I think uh, you're going to be able to see some people doing some of that skating uh, 
pretty soon. So un unless, in other words, unless something happens between now and the 19th, you could see that they would open uh, on the 19th, open on time. Yes, that, that word unless is a pretty big word. I mean, we're just finding out about the super infectious um, uh, strain, but uh, right now that's our focus, 19. Thank you. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. Zania Maldonado, Fox 61. A situation similar to what had happened at the Williams School in New London has been confirmed by school officials at the Country School in Madison, where some staff members were notified they could receive the COVID vaccine, and some actually went ahead and did. That's now two private schools where employees have accidentally received the COVID vaccine. So first question, what's the state's role in sending out those vaccine eligibility emails or does that fall entirely on the CDC and what's being done to prevent errors like this again? Um, I'm going to pass this right over to Deirdre, which is my norm, but I will tell you the other 99.9% .9 of vaccines have gone to people where it was appropriate and were uh, in the right priority list. Deirdre? Um, right. Uh, so to answer your question about, you know, the, the role of the state in, in those uh, appointments, well, we work with employers. They give us a roster of the employees that are eligible, and then um, an email is sent to those employees explaining to them how to schedule an appointment. Um, there have been a few isolated cases with very small numbers, as you point out, um, of uh, rosters that were mistakenly uploaded and some people who got a vaccine uh, a little bit out of out of their uh, place in the prioritization. Um, the, the go, going back to the chart that the governor showed between the micromanagement and the Wild West, um, we're working really hard to thread that needle. And um, inevitably, when you do that, there's going to be some bumps in the road and there's going to be some um, uh, people that are that's slightly out of order. And, you know, uh, teachers are going to be uh, likely in the next phase, so they may have gone a little bit early. We found out about it. We've addressed it. Um, in answer to your question of uh, how we're addressing it, we have been in almost constant communication, the team at DPH, with employers, providers, individuals, emailing them. We're setting up help desks, um, our website, um, to make sure everybody is crystal clear on this. Um, we are, are not going to be taking a punitive approach unless we see egregious examples of people intentionally jumping the line in large numbers. Um, we want people to, uh, to uh, keep their place in line, which we're uh, observing in the vast, vast majority of cases they are doing. Thank you. And then, Governor, just yesterday, a police cruiser in West Haven was stolen, two officers injured, and auto-related crimes have nearly doubled in some cities. Many officials say this is due to the COVID pandemic, specifically the rise in crime committed by juveniles. Now, last month, you mentioned New Haven and Waterbury police would receive $125,000 grants from federal COVID-related aid for this rise. Is there any other involvement coming from the state to tackle rise in auto-related crime. Yeah, you're right. We did give um, additional uh, resources for overtime and support um, in a number of our cities where some of these auto-related crimes and other um, type crimes have been shooting up shootings, for example. I think uh, that was uh, really important. Don't leave your keys in the car. Don't leave the fob in the car. Do everything you can to prevent this. I know um, some of the places, some of the cops are going around um, even, you know, reminding people of that fact. Uh, I think, yeah, there's a lot of stress. Uh, we've seen that related in, in um, addiction, related in abuse, and related in, in crime, all with uh, as we go into the 10th month of COVID. But um, I think we're dealing with it. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, Mr. Governor, and maybe, maybe Josh, could you expand a little bit on the current vaccine effort are you uh you confident there's no waste and everything is on schedule want that josh sure um yes we're, we're very happy with how things are going so far we're constantly finding opportunities to to do better and go faster um but um you know i think the partnership between our provider community the hospitals the federally qualified health centers our local health departments cbs walgreens 
and our State Department of Public Health has been really strong. And the communication, as the commissioner just mentioned, has been excellent. And as a result, we're getting the doses out where they where they can most quickly be administered to a wide variety of providers. We're getting them to the, the people in phase 1A. We're moving through those populations. We're planning for the next phase. So um, I think overall, uh, things have been going well, and I think our national rankings uh, back that up. The Associated Press. Uh, thank you, Max. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Commissioner Gifford, I, I watched the allocation subcommittee meeting, and there seemed to be some pretty big outstanding questions, such as whether people 65 and under or over um, should be uh, vaccinated, um, not just 75, and people under 65 with pre existing conditions. And there was even a debate about whether or not certain frontline workers are the cause for spread and whether or not we should instead focus on helping people who are most risk of getting sick or dying of getting um, the vaccine. I'm, I'm just wondering, do you anticipate these changes to be part of these recommendations on Monday? And will this, and also, when are they meeting again? Um, there was a real um, healthy debate at the allocation subcommittee. Healthy discussion, I think, is the way to, to characterize it, which is important. It's why the governor um, appointed these committees in the first place because we wanted the public to have access to the kind of really difficult challenges that are involved in making these allocation decisions. Um, so, yeah, there, there are still, as we both mentioned, some um, unanswered questions. But the group was also weighing the trade-offs between expanding um, Group 1B much further and, uh, and delaying the vaccination for those people that they've already confirmed they want to see in Group 1B. So uh, the, the group will be meeting early next week. I believe the meeting is scheduled for Tuesday. Um, and um, they will be discussing those things. And I, I do anticipate some potentially narrow expansions of Group 1B. Um, but in general, I think the sentiment expressed was that they didn't want to expand the group so large that it would make it difficult for those very high-risk individuals to get access early on in the 1B process. Does evidence that we have the variant here in Connecticut, does that, that wasn't, I think, news when they met last time. Is that going to change anything, Do you, especially since these two uh, people are, are quite young? Well, as Dr. Edie said, I mean, it just highlights the importance of, of everyone who's eligible getting their vaccine as, as soon as they can. And uh, for us moving swiftly as a state um, through these phases and, and getting every single dose that we have on the ground into somebody's arm as quickly as possible. So that's our goal. I don't think it necessarily changes the allocation st uh, strategy itself, uh, but it, it does emphasize the need, uh, the need for speed, as they say. I know that Governor Raimondo in uh, Rhode Island said that her state's vaccination efforts are being hampered by a lack of supply. And she said other states are in, quote, the same boat. I don't know if either you or Governor uh, Lamont can answer this, but do you think like Connecticut could handle more doses and that we should be getting more? We could handle more doses. Uh, we've got a good platform in place. We're rolling out to the retail outlets right now. so. Um, so I'd say, Sue, uh, bring it on. Um, don't hold back. And do you agree with what she said? And she was pretty strong about it, saying her, effort, her state's efforts are being hampered by the lack of supply. Uh, as, as we described, you know, Josh and the team, they're getting the uh, vaccines out to people on a timely basis. A higher percentage are getting um, vaccinated on a timely basis. We're reaching out to those communities that are probably a little hesitant about getting vaccinated. So it is um, a complicated process. But your core answer is, if they could ramp up production, they could figure out the supply chain, get us twice as many vaccines, we could get twice as many people vaccinated quicker. Okay, and, and also yeah. yesterday, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Sue, to interrupt. I was just going to say, as an example of this, you know, we were not able to fulfill all of the requests that we received for vaccine doses from our providers this week, right? Because we're just not getting enough into the state right now. So I think that's the answer to your question. If, if we have people asking for more than we're able to provide because of the supply coming in. So if we could get more, we could go faster. And are you getting what um, you've ordered or what your, are those um, promises, are they accurate ultimately? 
Yes, the, uh, the the weekly forecasts that we get a week or two in advance, they've been sticking to those. Um, so there haven't been surprises there necessarily, but we, we would like to see the overall numbers go up. Okay, thanks. I appreciate your time. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just a uh, second, I want to look at my notes. I want to, I think, follow up on a question Sue had just asked. To, 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 uh, change the likelihood. Uh, I'm sorry, that one uh, went out there. Hey, um, but getting back to the to, to the meeting, one of the one of the real thorny issues uh, it struck me was the discussion, and I think uh, Dr. Edy uh, touched on this earlier, was uh, you know uh, um, how where do you put people in communities, racial and ethnic minority communities that are at higher risk? Um, I mean, that's certainly a, a large population in the state. And, um, you know, you're trying to keep, or at least DPH is recommending that this uh, 1B group be kept to about 800,000 people. Uh, the recommendation to add uh, congregate settings, I believe, what, uh, up that pool by, 46 or 50,000, um, what, I mean, how large of a, uh, of much of these uh, disproportionately affected communities could be included practically in uh, 1B without delaying, overly delaying the, uh, the distribution? Reg, Deirdre, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say those conversations are still taking place and, and you heard the passion around the discussion. Um, you know, where we landed thus far in including the congregate settings was very satisfying. Uh, we are paying attention, if you remember the, the slide that the governor went over with the prioritizations, we're satisfied there. And then this last bullet point, uh, I think really highlighted uh, the passion that was expressed in the conversation. That is that we have a group of brown and black uh, citizens that are dying at a disproportionate rate. So the conversation will continue. We made great headway. Uh, and I think that you heard at the end of the, at the, end of the meeting uh, that we were highly satisfied. Well, what I heard at the end of the meeting was a pretty tense exchange between, uh, I think it was Dr. Miller and, uh, and uh, the, the subcommittee co-chair, uh, uh, Michelle Mullins. So um, it, it, I guess that sort of illustrates the sensitivity uh, of this discussion and how is that going to affect your future uh, deliberations on this uh, very uh, important issue? You know, as the commissioner said, I mean, this is very important work, but it's also very, very tough work. Uh, and so we're going to let the science uh, answer questions for us. We're going to let the data drive our decisions. Uh, and I think what you're describing really is passion. Uh, but, you know, just, just based on where we landed and the subsequent conversations that we're now planning to have, I am very comfortable and proud and, uh, to say that we're, we, we've landed in a very uh, decent place. Okay. And in terms of uh, this, this schedule that the governor mentioned uh, earlier uh, in the, uh, in the uh, presentation uh, about the, the next phase, is that going to happen Monday? Is that going to happen at a Thursday briefing? Uh, is, can you give us an idea of when we might expect that information to be uh, shared publicly? Which information, Paul? Um, the uh, the schedule for 1B, the timeline, I believe. Right. So um, so the the allocation subcommittee will make its final recommendations to the governor early next week. So those those final things will be shared in the in the latter part of the week. In terms of the um, the schedule for rolling things out, that will happen um, uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. As soon as we determine when uh, to to start rolling in the 1B populations. Um, with our providers. So today we're meeting with provider groups and talking to them about um, starting this transition. And then um, as the governor pointed out in his slide, we'll begin to notify some members of 1B um, uh, beginning next week that they will be able to schedule appointments um, later on in the month. Um, I, I do wanna just say again, uh, the word that Josh used and the governor has used with which is patience. Um, we really uh, understand how anxious everybody is to know when they'll be able to get their vaccine. And we're, we're working as hard as we can to get you the specifics that you need. Um, and, but 
there will be uh, some more time needed to get everything um, uh, clarified and get all the information out to everyone who needs it. So we'll ask for your patience for a few days more. And okay, and and just uh, the final question for me is uh, following up on the uh, the sports questions because obviously you guys are aware that very people are very very interested in in that. When would a decision be announced? When would some sort of decision be made or or a consensus announced uh, about uh, the next steps? I mean, you know, January nineteenth is is coming up awful quick, and you're meeting with them uh, the CIAC tomorrow. I'll, I'll jump in um, first. First of all. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Gifford, um, who has been leading this effort in a lot of ways uh, when it comes to sports, as, as well as individuals in our office like Thomas, Tom St. Louis and others. Uh, she's already been meeting with CIAC, as well as myself meeting with our regional uh, state partners. Uh, we, we will expect providing more clarity and guidance uh, well before uh, the January 19th uh, deadline. Uh, we will also be providing more information uh, as a follow-up meeting to the one that she's already has occurred, um, Dr. Gifford's already occurred with uh, Glenn Lungarini and the CIAC uh, as well. Uh, the team has been working very hard on this, really getting an understanding of uh, not only the uh, various rates, but also what's going on in our other states as well. Uh, but uh, there will be very much clarity that will be provided uh, in the coming days. Okay, thanks very much. That's all from me. The CT Examiner. Thanks, Max. Hi, Governor. My name is Amelia Adi from the CT Examiner. There's been some discussion now that the state legislature is back in session over whether the legislature should have a greater role in determining the details of how any new or future federal coronavirus relief money is allocated. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, hi, Amelia. Um, look, we, we, the, the funding that was uh, just recently voted on and uh, will be coming our way relatively soon, uh, the federal government's got really strict uh, rules attached to how that money is being spent. Obviously, most of it is PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, goes right from the federal government, unemployment, um, some, um, some other things that are quite specific in terms of how it's going. But believe me, Melissa and Paul will be working very closely with the legislature so they know um, how that money is being invested and spent over the next uh, 12 months, because we have 12 months uh, through the end of this calendar year to make sure it goes to COVID-related expenses in an appropriate way. And I'll also add this, uh, each branch of government has a role, and we understand what the role of the executive branch is. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Good afternoon, everybody. Will the vaccines be mandatory for those who are living in congregate settings? And if not, uh, will those who decline to be vaccinated be quarantined? Want that, Deirdre? No, we, there have been no discussions of mandatory vaccines at this point. And in terms of quarantine, you know, um, those decisions will be individualized based on the setting and, and um, based on the prevalence of others in the setting who've been vaccinated. So that's a, a sort of a one-off decision. Gotcha. And will the rollout for, for prisons or hospitals be done by facility or is it gonna target congregate settings where some of the more elderly residents live? Well, many of the congregate settings that where elderly are living are already part of our long-term care pharmacy partnership that, that CVS and Walgreens are helping us with. So we've already started to switch from nursing homes into assisted living facilities. We'll also be doing low-income elderly housing through that partnership and our residential care homes, for example. So most of those that are predominantly um, uh, elderly residents will have been done already as part of phase 1B. And then, uh, excuse me, phase 1A. Then when we get into 1A, um, we'll start uh, rolling out uh, to the various settings, really depending on, um, you know, the availability of our uh, partners to do mobile vaccine and uh, the availability of the doses that we have. Got it. Thank you. And Governor, why aren't there universal COVID-19 reporting met metrics for state agencies that are responsible for different from different groups living in different congregate settings. Like for instance, Demas and the Department of Correction report their numbers differently on a weekly or daily basis. Uh, why can't those be standardized? 
Um, I'll start and then pass that right over to Josh. What I do know is um, obviously the vaccination metrics are relatively new. We've been doing the COVID-related metrics, um, and we are more transparent and get more of that information to you on a timely basis. We've got the website that gives you uh, real updates. Uh, what is not uh, consistent in there, Josh? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I think it was, it was right on, Governor. I mean, look, we're putting out a lot of data. If it's not in the same column formats or something, you know, I guess we could, we could take a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, question for Dr. Gifford and uh, Dr. Edie. Um, this comes from uh, people on the public who are asking. The Allocations Committee, do they formally vote on these recommendations and watching the the meeting it's never it's never really clear how something goes from being something discussed to um to being part of the recommendations and we have not had any formal vote uh in any of our subcommittees however remember i mean our job is to deliberate we have an ideal or a diverse representation of each of our subcommittees and then the recommendation from each of the subcommittee goes to the advisory group and then the advisory group does this, goes through that same process and in turn makes a recommendation to the governor. So will the advisory group vote on the, these recommendations? All of our committees are operating by consensus. So when we laid out the ground rules for the advisory group right at the beginning, the, the decision was that um, they would seek consensus on any recommendations that went to the governor. Um, uh, and they would convey the consensus opinion. If there was any dissent among the committee members, that would also be conveyed to the governor. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on something uh, Kellen was asking a moment ago about uh, mandatory or talking about mandatory our vaccinations in congregate settings. And you said there wasn't uh, there wasn't discussion of it. I was wondering specifically when it comes to prison inmates, will there be mandatory vaccinations? Because as I understand it, there is currently mandatory um, testing, right, for, for the inmates? Josh, Deirdre, do you know that? There, there's mandatory testing for the, the staff, for the corrections officers, um, not, not for the inmates. That was negotiated with the bargaining unit um, as an important measure that we felt was required. Okay. Uh, one question for the governor. Um, it's been reported now that the, the governor of Rhode Island is being tapped by the uh, president-elect for a commerce post. I was wondering, has there been any discussions with uh, you and the uh, new incoming administration about maybe a job? No, no discussions with me, but I really wish Gina well. I think it's a great choice, and we've got a good friend now as Secretary of Commerce. Okay. Um, I know you've been asked this before, but are you interested? No. All right. Thanks, everybody. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. Uh, what protocol is in place for people who are under 75 to determine that they do have a condition um, that they would qualify to be under one phase B? Or could people um, kind of be lying about having an underlying condition just to be pushed to the front of the line? So first of all, people under 65 are not currently uh, part of phase 1B. Um, and the people uh, who are by ACIP recommended to be part of phase 1C are those under between the ages of 16 and 64 um, with multiple chronic conditions. The CDC has actually published a list of those conditions that make uh, uh, complications or death from COVID more likely. We'll be working off of that list and we'll be working with healthcare providers um, as well as individuals to make sure that people ha actually have those conditions uh, when they sign up for their vaccine. Thank you. Hearst Media. Thanks, Max. Uh, Governor, do we, do we know what Connecticut's genome sequencing capacity is uh, in order to, to keep an eye on the extent of this new strain? And uh, is, it, is it just Yale, Jackson Labs, and the state lab, or, or are there others? I think that's it. Isn't that right, Deirdre? Yes, and to be clear, the state lab is not doing genomic sequencing. We're helping to coordinate getting the, the specimens to those two labs that are doing the sequencing. 
And I'm not aware, I'm not aware that there are others, there aren't others that we're coordinating with. Uh, sem Semaphore does a lot of sequencing as well. There might be some other smaller research labs around the state too. But do we have a rough idea of, of what the capacity is on like a weekly basis on, on how many samples are tested? I don't know the answer to that question, no. Thanks. And then, Governor, are we going to see any more uh, restrictions on, um, I guess, people's personal lives or, or on businesses for uh, now that now that the strain is here? Is that something you've given thought to? I sure hope not. Um, uh, I, I do see, you know, in what's going on in Europe. So we watch that pretty carefully, Peter. But um, right now, following hospital uh, capacity. Um, I think we're in pretty good shape, so I don't anticipate any changes, but um, we'll see if that changes. Thanks, and then I had one more. Um, with uh, the hesitancy for uh, nursing staff that's been reported, do you think there's gonna be more clinics added to beyond just the three um, for nursing homes to, to try to, to get some of those hesitant people on board? I'll throw in my two cents, which is always dangerous. Um, I would probably stick right now because maybe there's some people waiting and waiting, and I'll, I'll go for the next one. I, I think it's good to have some finality so you know, here's your uh, last chance to get this vaccine. Uh, don't, don't waste your shot. The Hartford Current. Hey, everybody. This is Emily Brindley from The Current. Um, first off, just a quick logistic question, Governor. When you were discussing the the partial recommendation that the allocation subcommittee has sent to you, was that you formally endorsing what they have recommended so far, or are you just kind of sharing that information right now? I think it makes pretty good sense so far, Emily. Okay, so you are formally kind of approving that part of the recommendation, knowing that there's still some more of the recommendation to come. Uh, I'm formally approving it as long as I have the right to change my mind if something changes. Makes good sense to me. Okay, fair enough. And um, I, I was also just looking for some clarification on which groups are still being considered for phase 1B. Is that people under the age of 75 with high-risk conditions, or is it just people 65 to 74 with high-risk conditions? Go ahead, uh, Deirdre. Yeah, so um, I think the group was, when we ended the meeting, the group was um, trying to focus in on a narrow population that could be added to 1B, but also address some um, issues of, of equity and disproportionate um, mortality and illness. So I think the most likely group that they'll land on, but I don't, I don't want uh, to speak for the committee, but I think the most likely direction they're headed is that individuals slightly under age 75, maybe 65 to 74 with chronic conditions might be added uh, to group 1B, but we'll know more for sure at the beginning of next week. That sound right, Reggie? Yes, that sounds actual. Okay, thank you. And I also wanted to ask, you mentioned that um, some people in phase 1B will be vaccinated first or, or the appointments will open to them first. So what's the stratification of phase 1B and, and how strict will those stratifications be? I think Deirdre said, uh probably open up to those uh, 75 and above um, first, those not in nursing homes, given the, uh, the nature of uh, the risk that they're under. I think that'd be a first group to think about. Then Deirdre and Red will, will think beyond there. Remember, every time somebody says, let's add more people to phase 1B, uh, our limitation is the number of vaccines we have, Emily. So when you say, let's add them, you're sort of saying, who do you, who do you want to move to the back of the line? Because uh, there's, a, there's a balance there. So I, I think um, Deirdre and Reg and their team have a pretty good balance in terms of emphasizing public health, individual risk, and uh, for those essential workers, making sure they can go to work safely and keep uh, providing the services we need so desperately. And, and one last question. Um, on one of the slides that you showed earlier, it looked like there's about uh, 40 to 50 percent uptake of the vaccine among nursing home staff. And I think it was 60 to 70 percent among healthcare workers, uh, the rest of healthcare workers. Do you have concerns about the, that uptake number? And, and maybe, Dr. Edie, if you could speak to this specifically um, at St. Francis, that, that would be great. 
Yeah, so I mean, clearly we have concerns, uh, but but I am not that concerned about the concerns. What we're finding is that the more concerns that we address that that uh, are that exist amongst those that are close to the bedside, the more questions we answer, uh, the more available we are to address any anxieties that they have, the more likely they are to take the vaccine. So at St. Francis, since you asked what we're doing, is uh, we are continuing to have uh, webinars for our colleagues. You probably saw that we are now transitioning our webinar to the community. Uh, we even got a request for some of our colleagues whose first language is not English. And so we're having webinars in different languages such as Spanish. Uh, what we understand is that you know explanation through education is really the key um, we believe to address hesitancy and our data shows this, that, just that. Before webinars, we do the one question poll, how likely are you to take the vaccine? We have the conversation, we repeat the poll, and we see phenomenal increases in those that are likely to take it immediately. Um, as everyone has said, the rate limiting factor remains to be the, the availability or supply of the vaccine, uh, but we're gonna continue to push, we're gonna continue to do what we need to do throughout the entire state for all groups, for all people, to ensure that when their time comes up, they're ready to roll their sleeves up and receive the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Edie. And, and Governor, or maybe Josh, if one of you could speak about those percentages among nursing home staff as well, I'd appreciate that. Sure, well, I, I think a couple of themes we've heard um, is one, as we've discussed before, C under the federal agreement that CVS and Walgreens are operating to uh, vaccinate at the nursing homes, they're gonna make three visits. And so one of the things we've heard is that some staff said, I'm gonna pass on the first one, see how it goes, knowing that I can still get my two doses at the second and the third clinic. So I think there we'll see you know, some additional uptake as the second clinics start, which actually are starting to kick in um, next week as we finish the first round this week, uh, tomorrow, in fact. Um, so that's one factor. I, we've also heard a little bit around some people um, on the third shift who typically work the third shift. Most of these clinics are during the day. So it is an extra hardship um, for some folks to come in. Um, it's really, we, we, we're dependent on the operators, the nursing home owners and operators to work with their staff and do what they need to do to make sure people come in to get their vaccines. Um, I think it's a similar model to when they do flu clinics in normal years. So this is not new, but we need the partnership there. And then beyond that, I think it's just myth busting. You know, some of the myths that, are, that may circulate out there about the vaccine and just continuing to do the education, hear the testimonials. And we are optimistic that those numbers will go up. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's right, Emily. You can see what we're doing in terms of public outreach. You can see that uh, video telling people why it's important for you and your fellow workers so you're able to keep working. You heard Red GD talk about how we're doing the webinars and getting that translated in the multiple languages. Uh, Reg Deirdre, thank you for everything um, you guys are doing. I'll just, you know, leave you with one thought. Those pictures on TV last night were um, a little scary and we thought never in America. And it is just a reminder that democracy is fragile. But I do want to remind you at the end of the day, our institutions held up, our courts held up. And at the end of the day, at the very end of the day last night, um, Congress stood up and did the right thing on a bipartisan basis. I was um, moved by this picture of Vice President Pence and Speaker Pelosi standing on a bipartisan basis, uh, you know, ratifying the peaceful transition of power. So thank God for little things. Take care, everybody.